Ed. Um, uh, yeah, to make this slide, I Googled tall guy, shorter girl, and this is what I found. And then it's also funny because Luth is sweating in this visual here. Are you actually sweating though right now, Luth? It's pretty hot in my house, like the fire's going. Yeah, yeah. Um, so we're, we're from the, the Ian Martin group, um, raised recruiting, uh, and we've been teal for experimenting with teal for seven years now. And, um, it's a bit of a clickbaity title, you know, um, how, how teal saved us from COVID, but, uh, hopefully you'll see in the story, it really was pretty, pretty miraculous how, how teal, um, yeah, was the foundation for our success through COVID. So just a bit of background first about our company. Um, so we're a group of companies that, that work in the staffing and recruiting uh, industry. Um, we're actually a third generation company. We're 63 years old, um, have about 400 employees in Canada, the US, India, Philippines, and actually now Ghana. We've started to hire some recruiters out of Ghana, which has been great. Um, so a bit of a unique company in the staffing world. Um, our, our CEO and, and owner um, essentially inherited the company. His grandmother was one of the co-founders. And when he took over the company about just over 10 years ago, he actually turned it into a B Corp. Um, there was a session earlier that was talking about B Corps. So B Corps are kind of a certified social enterprise. So we're the only mid-sized staffing company in the world that, that's, a, that's a certified B Corp. Uh, and, and, you know, a big part of being a B Corp is that you're purpose driven and, and you actually put that into the governance of your company. Um, so our purpose is to connect people in meaningful work. And uh, we actually want to redeem the recruiting industry. Um, the recruiting industry has a lower reputation than the used car industry. So we're trying to, you know, raise the standards for, for how recruiting and staffing um, operates. So yeah, Luth and I worked in uh, one of the business units uh, called Fitzy. And seven years ago, we had just read Reinventing Organizations, like I'm sure many of you have. Uh, and we were so inspired by this, by the book, that we decided to experiment with self-management. Um, we, we actually, it was Valentine's Day seven, seven years ago. We called it Valentine's Day. And, and Luth and I formally announced that we were no longer managers. We were not the bosses anymore. Uh, and then we started reinventing uh, all the different practices that, that required a manager to do something. Um, you remember those days, Lou? I do. I remember eating cake every Valentine's Day. Yeah. Um, and I, I'm sure this theme has come up throughout the conference, but um, many times when organizations first adopt self-management, the idea is just get rid of managers. But um, those of us that have been through it know that you not only need to get rid of managers, but replace um, that system with something else. And um, through an evolutionary process, um, several years of experimenting and um, having our employees consent to different things, we ended up with this system. So we use a homegrown system. We call it the Teal Operating System. And it might be hard to see on the slide, but uh, basically, we make this flowchart available to every employee in all, all levels, all functions, all geographies, and everything starts when the employee notices a problem or opportunity, and then the chart guides the person on what their options are, what practices are available to them, um, how we recommend handling different things. So this is our standard operating system, operating model across um, our businesses, across our geographies, and... Um, yeah, that's, I think, our probably our most significant teal innovation is putting it all in this uh, chart. Then the story starts, I mean, I, I, if you imagine where were you when you uh, first heard about or first really confronted COVID, I was in um, our fanciest boardroom, the big oak table at a coordination meeting where people were saying, we need to close our offices. And I was like, close our offices, like, this is the flu. This happens every year. This is I don't need to close our offices. Um, so I was like being contrary in a boardroom. Edwin, I think you were like at a pool party or something. Yeah, I had just gone for a March break vacation with my family to Dominican Republic. I literally was at a foam party and, um, and this announcement, you know, is out there and 
I felt the same way. I was like, ah, this is, you know, maybe we should just get it because get it over with. It doesn't <laughs> seem to be a big deal. Uh, but then as, as the week went by, there's fewer and fewer people at the resort and, and everyone's taking it more and more and more seriously. And it, it, it ended up hitting our business, you know, really, really hard. Yeah, our, our business, um, I mean, our customers send us job orders. That's our, a key business metric for us. And our customer job orders cut in half immediately when COVID hit. So we had half as much business um, to work on and we were truly in crisis mode from, from the beginning. Yeah, it, it, it hit our entire industry hard. If you can imagine, you know, recruiting, that's the first thing that, that, that people stop doing. There's hiring freezes, there's layoffs. Um, you know, most of our competitors either did layoffs or hiring freezes themselves, which, which kind of sends shockwaves of fear throughout the organization. Um, and at our company, there was a lot of people, um, you know, that were initially quite afraid and thinking, you know, what's going to happen to us. And, you know, I remember calling our CEO and saying, maybe we should, we should, we should lobby for everyone to take a voluntary salary reduction. And so there was a lot of kind of fear and, and panic, um, initially. Yeah. And while Edwin was calling um, Tim to suggest that I was receiving calls like every single day from our recruiters. I was in a recruiting coordination position, so it made sense for them to call me. And I was getting over and over and over again. Am I going to lose my job? Like just level with me. Am I going to lose my job because I need to prepare? And um, all of those calls um, led me to suggest like, let's just get everybody on the phone. Let's get the whole company on a Zoom call. And I remember saying then there is no them. There is no secret group of people that's going to meet in a room to decide whether we all have jobs. You know, the people who are going to decide whether we have jobs is us um, by the, you know, creativity and engagement that we do our jobs by our ability to figure out how to save our own jobs and our friends. Um, and at the same time, you know, people started brainstorming how, how we could get through this. How could we reduce costs? For me, the most poignant moment in, in our business, in our COVID business um, journey was two women uh, from India. Our Indian staff work at night. So they have a meal allowance because there's nothing open for them to get meals. Um, two women recruiters from our Bangalore office called me and said that they had been thinking about it and talking about it together. And they had decided that they would give up their meal allowances until the crisis um, was over. So, you know, the meal allowances wasn't a great big expense in, in the grand scheme of things, but the sense of engagement and pride and determination that our average employees had for saving the business to me was the most touching thing. Yeah, it's, it's interesting because our Teal operating system says you can't be fired you can't there can't be a layoff there is no group of people that have that kind of power but this crisis brings those fears to the surface and provides an opportunity to remind everyone like that's technically not possible to do at our organization and um you know coming out of that call that luke talked about there were so many you know tactical and small ideas but there was also a sense that we needed to shift collectively our strategy as a company. And we use, um, it's a P Patrick Lencioni concept called the thematic goal. So the thematic goal answers for the entire company, what is most important right now? And pre-COVID, we had a thematic goal. Do you remember what it was? It was a like collaboration, something or other. Whatever it was, it was no longer <laughs> what was most important right now. So... Um, a few uh, people got together and, and posted this thread that you can see here. We use a decision-making software called Lumio. And so they posted this thread and they said, hey, we think we need to shift our thematic goal as a company. What do you think? And so their first idea was something along the lines of make every connection meaningful. And then I was looking at this the other day, there was 33 different comments and a lot of comments like, well, what does that mean? This needs to be instructive. That needs, this needs to kind of tell everyone what is most important to focus on. So through all of these comments, where we landed was a new thematic goal um, to pivot, to drive results and capture opportunity. 65 people voted for the proposal. And this was done within a month of, of the World Health Organization 
announcing, you know, that that this was a pandemic. So ra rather than having to wait for senior managers to hatch a new strategy or do some reorg, um, we just went from this open invite meeting to an entirely and fully developed strategy with defining objectives and like there was a whole bunch of detail all within a month. And I was reading through this thread and I had made a comment uh, uh, at the end of it. And I said, I am so proud to work at this company. It was really this galvanizing um, moment. So yeah, then everyone started pivoting, right, Luke? Yeah, and I think um, one of our first pivots was to get into healthcare. I think you can go straight to that. Oh yeah, so you know we 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 previously didn't have any experience really uh, in in healthcare staffing, but obviously that was an area that that, that needed a lot of hiring. Um, so our salespeople started, you know, making calls. The first place that we got into were were long term care facilities, retirement homes, which needed lots of nurses and PSWs. So we just started doing recruiting for long term care facilities then. One of the uh, provinces in, in Canada uh, that we we're already working with, they needed to ship laptops and load software on laptops to send it to home-based workers that, and they had no ability to do that. Well, okay, we can do that. So we literally had people who had no business loading software and doing shipping uh, in our offices and, 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 and being resourceful. And then later when that same province started their contact tracing program, so contact tracing is, you know, when someone gets COVID, then they're calling all of the contacts and kind of warning them to get tested. Um, they, you know, we, we asked them if they needed help in staffing that. And they said, we absolutely do. Um, so we ended up doing all of the recruiting uh, for the contact tracing program. Um, then, you know, another province in Canada, um, we approached them when they had to build a program. We said, we have all this experience doing that. And we started doing it for a second one. Then when the vaccine rollout came and they needed vaccine schedulers, uh, so we started doing that. Then we started doing it in the U.S. So it was this beautiful kind of domino. And before COVID, we had no experience doing any of these things. And all in all, we ended up hiring literally thousands and thousands of people to help fight against um, COVID-19. So it was pretty amazing. Yeah, I um, it, those are the largest projects I've ever seen in my recruiting career. And it was, to some extent, my responsibility to resource the recruiting uh, manpower for those projects. And we just didn't have anywhere near the scale to deliver that. And I did the, you know, I did the online equivalent of getting on a soapbox and saying, like, I'm just desperate. I was like, I'll take any worker and teach them how to do screening calls. And I ended up having from the company executives, sales people, the graphic designer, um, hitting the phones, talking to candidates, learning how to screen. We had to develop you know, scripts and tools to help them do it efficiently. But it was just this super fun, um, you know, we're all in this together, everybody pitch in and deliver this stuff. I think the most you know, exciting time in many of our careers, even though we were working day and night to get those projects delivered. Yeah, and while we were in pretty serious lockdown, most of us anyway, so all we had to do <laughs> was work. And yeah, there was a lot of extra hours being done uh, at that time. But what was also quite special about it was we were not only doing the recruiting uh, for one of the provinces, we were, we were actually managing um, about half of all of the contact tracers and contact tracing program. Um, the government just didn't, they had never done this before. They didn't have any ability to manage all these people. So our, uh, many of our most senior leaders um, stopped what they were doing and became um, senior managers of, of this entire you know, contact tracing workflow. Um, we're now experts in contact tracing, uh, but again, we, we were not before. And it's just, I think, again, the power when you have a bunch of people who are purpose-driven and um, all connected and working closely together. It's just incredible, you know, what you can accomplish. Yes. Uh, yeah, that. but it wasn't all, it wasn't all unicorns and rainbows, was it, Luke? Yeah, um, probably our largest workforce is in India. And some of you will remember that in the second wave of COVID, India was really um, seriously and dangerously affected. And, um, 
we had an employee uh, from our Bangalore office came to the central coordination team meeting and said, listen, like, this is dire. People, you know, people are going to die um, and we're scared and I don't know what to do. And that you know, that employee raising that led to, we formed an, kind of an emergency task force where a group of people abandoned their day jobs and became full-time emergency coordinators, helping our staff get anything they needed, oxygen, vaccines, travel, support. Um, and we made a fund available that the emergency um, task force could use to administer to help our employees get the same thing. So um, in I think we did have uh, one employee on a ventilator. Um, thankfully, he has fully recovered. Um, we didn't lose any staff. Um, so even like, I mean, I'm not going to say that was a happy situation at all. But again, people were able to rally together to do what they could with the resources that we had. Yeah, at the top of our teal operating system workflow is a question. Notice problem or opportunity. And then, you know, you know, you follow the workflow through there. And so this is just a time where anyone who was noticing problems and opportunities like here in India was just getting support from the rest of the company. Um, so just the, the difference that it make in, in terms of leadership experience was, was incredible. Uh, but, you know, from a people point of view, this was amazing, but also from a results point of view, um, it was pretty ridiculous. So in our more than 63 year history, we had by far our most su successful year from a profitability point of view. This was a 650% increase in our net income. Um, I'm, I'm in Canada. We call this a hockey stick curve here. Um, so pretty amazing. Um, and it wasn't just these, these healthcare projects. Um, every team in the company also pivoted um, to help uh, wherever they could and to, to shift and pivot their business. And after that initial contraction of the first few months of COVID, every team got back into growth and profitability, um, literally every team in our 400 uh, person company um, is doing well and, and ended up figuring out how to thrive. So uh, we, we've been at it with Deal for seven years. And I think you can imagine we've heard lots of naysayers saying, well, does it actually make business sense? It's great for HR and for people and people love it, but does it actually drive performance? And um, we've got a, a, pretty, a pretty sweet story here about how it did. Uh, and on top of that, these new healthcare projects actually developed an entirely new business unit for our company. So we turned our success in hiring thousands of people in healthcare and said, actually, let's take this factory and, and show other types of businesses how we can help when you need to hire hundreds of people quickly. Um, you know, we've got an offering to do that. Oh, and this slide um, at the, not at the end, we're still in COVID, but um, well into COVID and well into delivering the large projects, our central coordination team got together and did a retrospective exercise using this tool, a liberating structure of what, so what, now what. Um, and although again, although it, going into COVID, I think there was still a, a healthy amount of skepticism about whether the teal transformation had been worth it. The results of this um, activity were a pretty much unanimous pointing to our teal operating system as the thing that saved us, as the thing that caused people to feel so engaged that they just rallied around the cause of saving the company. Yeah, and I mean, at the end of the day, you know, today we see that there's millions of people quitting their jobs um, we've, we're in recruiting, we like to say it's, it's a candidate market today. Candidates have more power than they've ever had in the past. And what we've seen is that, um, companies that didn't put their employees first, that did layoffs or hiring freezes or did things to their employees or made decisions for their employees. Those are the same companies that cannot keep their employees today. Um, and, in our company, it's opposite. Um, that the kind of empowerment that a teal operating system um, provides is what makes the, the you know, employee realize, well, they actually do have my back. They actually 
there is a, a real and true loyalty that is built there. Um, and yeah, and, and so this, this is not only something that helped us to um, thrive through COVID, but it's helping us now coming out of, of COVID as well. So Luz, bring it home. That's the end of our story. How would you su kind of summarize um, this for, for everyone here? Yeah, you and I talked about, you know, what is the message of our presentation? Why are we telling the story? And for us, it's this. The teal transformation was hard, like really, really hard. And there were certainly days where it didn't seem like it was going to be worth it, or there were doubts about whether it was worth it. Um, both for those of us that were like totally bought into the system and certainly from those that weren't. After this crisis experience that we've gone through together, there, there's no question. Um, it was better for the people. It was better for the finances. It was better for our learning. It was better for our customers. It was, it's just better. Um, and I, I guess if there's one thing that we want to share, I don't know if some of you might be really far advanced in your self-organization journey. Some of you might be, might be day one. I have no idea. But from where we stand here on top of one mountain looking at another, um, we think, go for it. Keep going. It's worth it. Yeah. Yeah. So that's it. That's our story, Ed. Can you hear me again now? Yeah. Okay, Edwin and Luth, thank you guys. Thank you too so much for, for this inspiring story. I was getting a little misty eyed uh, toward the end there. And uh, it's, it's really uplifting to hear wh what, you've, what you've gone through. Um, I'm gonna, you know, we only have, I think about 13 folks in the room um, at the moment. So I think we can, I see a couple of questions in the Mentimeter, but maybe I'm just gonna say, since that system can be a little wonky, uh, let, me, let me share these first ones and maybe we can even have people speak use their voices, uh, if that's okay with you, Luth and, and um, Edwin. Uh, so let me start with the ones that are, you know, that have been submitted so far. One of those, um, you know, relates to one of the things you all were saying at the end, when we get out of this COVID situation soon, how do you see the next step of your journey? Do you think that the team will sustain these new habits and culture? It sounds like you started answering that, but what, what else might you say about that? Even if you take away like that, the crazy hockey stick growth from the big, big projects, like Edwin said, our underlying, like the business that we've always had, um, has been growing since we finished our self-organization transformation and is in its healthiest period of growth ever. So no one knows the future. I imagine we will face many more challenging things together. But I think our business is the healthiest that it's ever been um, in the many decades it's existed. Yeah, it, it is. And there's some work right now for us in terms of organizing and reorganizing. Because if you imagine if, when you have, you know, probably a third of the company all working on kind of one large or a few large projects, and then those are winding down. So now we have to figure out how to reintegrate and 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 um, but but that's that's a that's that's a beautiful process in teal, um, a hell of a lot easier than doing an orange you know reorg. But the one thing that I would say that at least I noticed, and this is um, hard to quantify, but the confidence that we gained as a company collectively is palpable, in my opinion. Um, after doing a bunch of things that we had no experience doing and doing a really great job, we now feel like we can tackle things. Um, I think we're more ambitious than we were before. You're nodding your head. Lou, do you agree with that? Yeah. That, that's a, a neat response. Uh, so it sounds like it's full teal ahead over there uh, at, at, at the organization. And related to what you just said about taking on new roles, the, the other question we, we had submitted to the, to the Mentimeter system is, how did your leaders, this is kind of, I, I had this question too. How did your leaders deal with the mental and emotional disconnect from leading within a teal organization and then going to a management role of staffers when you're dealing with the, the contact tracers? That, that's a totally different pro, you know, enterprise in, in a way. So can you speak to that issue a bit? I wasn't on that team. So I don't, 
know the answer like I've never specifically have you ever asked specifically asked on that Edmund I have I have okay actually. I'll let okay yeah. you do it then yeah so um yeah I talked to a couple of our senior leaders who basically were MIA for months um, just managing contact tracers and talking to government officials every day. And um, they used all of the same teal tools that we use for how we run meetings, how we're encouraging people to do advice processes, um, you know, kind of our collective sensing and responding type tools. They used those things and they got incredible feedback from the contractors and also from our government kind of clients. Um, and, you know, they would say that it was this, the secret sauce in our ability mm -hmm. to, to hire and train and, and actually deliver something very quickly with, with thousands of people. So technically we, we were managing these contractors, but that's not how we operated. Um, so it, mm -hmm. it worked really, really well. That's interesting to hear. You, you applied the teal principles, if I'm hearing you right, and that actually succeeded in that territory of suddenly managing all these uh, new people in a different business territory than you, than you were in before. Um, great. Well, we have a, there's a comment from Axel here about kind of an interesting story in India of a strike that led, led to sort of self-management naturally. I, I invite people to take a look at that in the chat. For those other folks um, who may have questions, uh, I would invite you all to, you know, Turn on your, your microphones and, and, and uh, speak them right away to, to, to Luth and Edwin here. We'll kind of self-manage that process. If, so we have multiple people talking, we'll pick one to go first. But anyone have a question they'd like to, to ask uh, of Luth and Edwin? Whoever asks the hardest question gets a prize from Ed. <laughs> we want to make Luth sweat like she was in the first picture. Right. Well, all right. I'll, I'll, not, not hearing anybody jump in yet, I'm going to share one that I, you know, Edwin, you and I talked yesterday, and one of the questions we talked about was giving folks a little bit more of a practical sense of how you do this, this teal operating system. You, you talked about some of the, the steps you take, but I wonder if you could share with me how you all have evolved this process for some of these really hands-on um, or, or very concrete self-management um, areas say, such as the what role people are going to play can you sp speak a bit about how the role advice process that you've developed has worked and how you've evolved it over time the question specific, specifically is about the role advice process yes i mean that's one i know that that uh, we talked about edwin and i thought that was interesting it could be another one that you'd want to share about can you get a mm -hmm. bit more practical mm -hmm. and say how you all have gotten to a really effective place with, with your teal operating system? Mm. Mm, I read in something yesterday, it might've been Samantha Slade's book, Going Horizontal, that a teal operating system or whatever you call it, a set of self-organizing practices is a perpetual beta. Yeah, and I yeah, think I that's it. true. Like we've been in beta for seven years. Uh, we made some practices and we kept the ones that were good and threw out the ones that were bad and then rinse, repeat, like rinse, repeat, rinse, repeat, rinse, repeat. We're constantly taking forward the best stuff and, um, you know, rejecting the stuff that isn't working and anybody in our organization can um, adapt our practices. So that's a bit sort of like part of your question is around how does the OS evolve? Mm -hmm. um, our rule advice process like everything else evolved as we needed to change our roles and our commitments to one another. Um, so we designed a, think of it as a templated process where a person does a self-reflection and gets advice from their peers and then makes a proposal about what role or roles um, they might be leaving behind or taking on. And you can do it. We don't have a formal, like you do it every year. You can do it as often as you need to change your role and you can do it never if your role is a very steady one and, and you don't have interest in changing it. Um, and it's, I think it's the practice that we most often get asked about or people borrow. Um, and that's not to say, that's not to say it's perfect. You know, I think sometimes I have my doubts about whether 
it is a great practice. And then sometimes I think, but so many other organizations have seemed to find it valuable and have um, borrowed it. So that's my take on it. Thank you, Luth. Edward, when you add anything to that, maybe you can say, did was that, I imagine you were doing that a fair amount within the past couple of years then. Is that is that a fair thing to say that roles were changing and you were going through this oh, yeah, yeah. process? Yeah, I've done five um, in the last seven years. Like I do them all the time. So uh, like, um, absolutely. And, and people do them all the time. Like it's happening all of the time. Someone is changing his or her role or roles or trying to get, even some people do it. Just I just need to get more clarity. Like what's important for me to work on right now. So it's a templated process to get input from your peers on what is the biggest contribution you could be making to the organization. And I just put in the chat for anyone that's interested. Um, we've got we po post all of our practices online and the and the whole workflow sheet, so you can check that out. Um, but as Luth said, it's it's like okay, we're going to reinvent a practice that needed a manager. Um, so let's just try. Let's put out a V1, and it always sucks in some way that we don't realize. And then you make it better. You make a V2 and a V3. The way that we do that is we actually require that any changes to our what we call common practices require all company consent. So we use this Lumio decision making tool. Someone would make a proposal, say, hey, I want to change this part of the role advice process. And then everyone in the company has the ability to say, yeah, I consent to that. It can either live with that or I agree with that. Or like, no, I have an objection and I'm committed to helping you overcome the objection. I can't just say no and take my ball and go home. I got to say, okay, here's how I want to fix it. Uh, and then, you know, in that way, the practices are just always getting better. Uh, and everyone, because it impacts everyone, everyone has an ability to participate in that. That's great. Uh, that's also, I can imagine, potentially frustrating if everyone has to sign off uh, on it. Um, is that, is that, Get to no, some place. no, no, not, no, not, not everyone has to, but everyone can. Yeah. So, okay. yeah. So not everyone has to, but everyone can. Gotcha. All right. Um, another question that came in, uh, Luth and Edwin has, they might be covered already, but they're asking about the, the teal practices that helped you most in the last couple of years, especially when the times were tough. You've not, you mentioned a number including the Lencioni question around kind of the purpose and pivoting quickly. Are there any you haven't surfaced that you would, you'd call out as well here? We, we use a weekly check-in tool called 15.5. And two or three weeks ago, the, the question every employee got was which, you know, which is our most powerful, or I don't remember how it was phrased, which is your favorite teal practice. And I, I read done tons of them. And it was quite inconsistent. Like some people will tell you that our, one-to-one -one feedback is the most valuable practice. For me, it's um, micro habits around equal talking time and generous listening and what it like, mm -hmm. what does it really mean to listen to what somebody else is saying? And somebody else will tell you it's the role advice process and somebody else will tell you. So I think it's one of those, it, it's, it's a quite a subjective thing. Um, that's my take on it. I would say personally, if I had to pick one, my favorite is the role advice process, because this is something that even a company without, you know, that's fully self-managed can do this. So if you're a manager and, you know, someone's not totally happy or wants to change their role, you just ask them to do a role advice process and make a proposal to you. And why I like that is it, 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 it kind of forces everyone to get feedback, to ask questions, and to have the visceral experience of, I am charting my own path. I have to make a proposal for what I am going to do. And, uh, you know, like people, I can just listen to what people want me to do, but ultimately it's my proposal to make. And I just think that that's an experience that everyone needs to live um, and go through, uh, and it can be quite powerful. Super. Okay. I just realized that some people are raising their hands electronically. I'm sorry if I ignored you guys for, ignored you for a long time, but uh, I see that Haroon has a question or a comment and so does Tolga. So why don't I, Haroon, why don't you go first? Uh, thanks for, for raising your hand. No problem. I just, I wanted to get into the challenge. Um, but I think a question I want to hear answered is how is your central coordination committee different from executive teams of other companies? 
Arun is, um, works with us, is the steward of our TLOS. So I don't know, like, if this is a trick, this is a trick question. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I think I want to, I think it's for people to, to hear it. Okay. Yeah, I, do you I, want I, to answer? I'm curious about that too. Do, do we, should I answer? Do you want to answer, Arun? No, I want you to answer. Okay, so we have a central coordination team whose members are nominated and uh, annually. Um, they meet together weekly. So Jamal, who's here on this call, is on that team. So is Edwin. Um, they meet together weekly, generate the agenda in the moment, talk about whatever topics are most pressing. And their purpose statement is, is to take care of problems and opportunities for the whole organization. So each team can take care of the stuff that is in my, my part of the world, but who's looking out for everybody? So that's their mandate. They, they work the same as all the rest of us. If they want to make a decision, they have to follow the flow chart. They have to get the consent or the advice of people that are impacted. Um, but their mandate is to look out for, for things that affect everybody. Uh, did some of the leaders from the earlier system, earlier organization, I'm just going to ask a follow-up question here. Did they gravitate toward that coordinating committee or did you find that some like executives from the past in Martin oh, yeah. version yeah, go yeah, to other places? Yeah. yeah, that, no, like executive team went down hard. Um, we had to, like, I, I was on that team for four years until like four weeks ago. And I had to work hard from the inside out and so did others to change the mindset of that team to create the structures that allowed it to be self-renewing, um, to be constantly vigilant about like not reconsolidating power to the people who were used to having it. Yeah, like, and that's a, that, that's a whole other conference topic. Mm. Um, There's your ne next year's presentation, Luth. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Edwin. Okay, interesting. Um, all right, well, I want to make sure we get Tolga's uh, voice in here. Tolga, do you want to sh share yeah. your question or, or comment? Uh, apologies if you already touched upon it. I came in a bit later, but I'm interested in hearing a little bit about your compensation um, process. I know it's on the site. I didn't read it. Thank you for sharing your practices. Really cool that you do that. How is it now and how did the transition um, flow. What were the pain points? What were the hopes? Which hopes were gained, and which pains are still existing? Yes, that's such a such a great question, Tolga. Thank you for asking it. Um, I'm hogging the question time. I think is that okay? No, this is all you. This is all. This you. is this is my jam. Uh, so we use a compensation advice process where, let's say, I'm feeling like I'm not paid correctly for my job. I initiate this process. I gather advice from three to five people who are knowledgeable about my work and about market and internal compensation. They give me their advice and then I make a unilateral decision about my compensation. Um, it is not consent-based in our company. I just decide this is the new salary and I'm immediate, like effective immediately, I am paid the new salary. And the safeguard is if, um, you know, someone thinks that I'm not worth that or I'm not contributing at that level or, you know, it's not a good use of the company's funds, they could initiate a kind of review for me. Um, but to my knowledge, that's never happened over a compensation decision. So comp, I would say, don't do it as your first practice, like build the muscles, you know, build the muscles of advising and conflict resolution and being candid. You have to build those muscles before you like attach money to it. Um, but I think it's going really well. Like people do set that they do legitimately set their own compensation. And there's a couple people that are still grumpy about, you know, so-and-so paid themselves $500 more than they're supposed to, but you know, it's working, that, I think. That's fast. That's pretty fascinating that you haven't had any of those reviews up to now, and that the, that the person has their has the final say over what they're paid. So I, I, I'm struck by yes. that. And another yeah. another session uh, over time. Yeah, from, yeah. From you we have had the reviews. The review is a like like we call it the contribution review is an active practice that absolutely gets used. But I don't think it's ever been initiated over somebody's compensation. Like. Oh, you chose to pay yourself too much. It's usually like, mm -hmm. hey, for the last six months, you've been terrible at your job. And like, yeah. let's look at this together. 
Okay. Yeah. Well, well, just one thing to add to that. I think there's many myths about teal and one of the myths or fears is like, oh, if you let people self-sit salaries, they're going to take advantage of that. We've seen the opposite that people will Mm. tend to pay themselves less than what they would have asked for. So that's why we chose to make it um, your own decision. But the advice that you've gotten from everyone is public to those people, to your advisors. So if someone went way off base, paying themselves way more than what everyone thinks they should make, that would be very clear. And so that kind of Mm. social reinforcement is more powerful than than a Mm. rule um, in our experience. I love that. Um, the other, can remind, I add? Go ahead. Yes, one please. Thing. I'm, I'm so passionate about this topic, but the other safeguard, in my opinion, is like right now, the company is doing very, very, very well. Like there's all this money and there's profit sharing and it's, it's feast times. So, okay, let's say a bunch of people do go a little generous and pay themselves a little more than maybe, you know, the old guard thinks is reasonable and the situation reverses. And now we're like, oh no, we're in crisis mode again. We already have the muscle memory of like, guys, we're spending too much money. Everybody like tighten your belts. And it, it would just happen without any drama because people have had the experience mm. of truly having the freedom. You know, like yeah. I truly had the feel freedom to pay myself a lot. So if I need to later reverse that, I will do that to save my own freedoms, really. Mm-hmm. That's really neat, neat to hear. I Just to add one bit of context to that point, and I think it's so true that people don't, how could you trust people to pay themselves well? They're going to take advantage of it. And and that subtle social pressure that you described, Edwin, with the, the public commentary and advice, it reminds me of what, what I learned has happened a lot with hunter-gatherer societies over time, where there is these subtle ways of keeping people from feeling like they're the they're the best, you know, and whether it's, you know, and if you start taking too much of your share of the, of the, of the kill, you're going to get mocked and then it can get higher from there. Um, so that really need to hear that. Um, anybody else with a, with a question? I have another one up my sleeve, but I, I want to make sure we make sure, make sure people's uh, questions are answered or you can speak up into the conversation here. Feel free to either just speak up or, or do your electronic hand or put a question in the chat, lots of different modes here. All right, I'm gonna jump in with another one then that Edwin, you and I talked about a bit yesterday, which is going off on a, you know, zooming out to the 30,000 foot or I don't know how many feet level, but you and I talked about applying some of what you've learned about Teal succeeding Ian Martin Group and what's happening in Ukraine right now. And some of the successes of the Ukrainian resistance and you actually saw some application teal bulls, especially purpose, I think. Can you speak about that a bit? Maybe Luce, you want to do as well, but I know Edmund, you were ready to talk about that a bit. Um, yeah, well, and, and Luce and I were actually just talking a little bit about purpose yesterday. And I think um, purpose is something that obviously the teal world talks a lot about, but you know, Simon Sinek says purpose isn't isn't a word. It's not the statement that you write. It is the feeling that you have when you're doing meaningful, you know, impactful work. And um, that's it was our purpose, our purpose in connecting people in meaningful work and saving the company and fighting COVID that drove this kind of incredible success that we had, not only in getting the results, but in working together. Like Luke said, just there was no politics or bureaucracy or BS or, you know, people just team together. And I think you're seeing the same thing in Ukraine. You're seeing the, the U- Ukrainian resistance united by the, the highest, most powerful purpose that you could, you could really have. And, and then you see versus the Russians who greatly outnumber them but probably have very little or maybe no purpose or maybe don't even want to be there or don't aren't believing um, in that. So I think it's a great example in both in Ukraine and our example of um, how valuable it is to get to remind people of purpose, to align purpose, to talk about it, to unify around that. Um, and I think that's, that's what Teal organizations 
have as a significant advantage versus orange and, and green organizations in the world, I would say. Thank you, Edwin. Luth, would you add anything to that? You're nodding your head along the way. What he said. <laughs> Does anyone else in the in the, uh, the the session here want to comment on that that point? I think it's a you know, we're all a lot of us are thinking about this this challenge, this invasion, and I am inspired by what you just said there, um, Edwin. Any any other comments or questions along those lines? One other observation I'll make in case, and, and also please feel free to ask other questions. We've got about another 12 minutes of the session altogether. Uh, ask other questions about going back to the Ian Martin group and, and what you heard from Luth and Edwin. But I think self-management is another principle I see happening in Ukraine. We're, we're just get groups of 10 folks together and, and trust them to, to navigate urban resistance, you know, or, or create camouflage nets or cook for people and or set up uh, trenches in your village. It just seems like there's a an upswelling of self-management without uh, the need for this top-down dramatic levels of uh, ordering your people around. It, would you guys con con concur with that or what are your thoughts there? I think um, self-organization is the, yeah. it's the organizing principle of nature. Like I think rigid hierarchy is the mm. exception, not the rule, but somehow mm. we've internalized the opposite. I live on a farm and I walk outside every day and see self-organization. Um, I remember there was one time there was a rock and it was in my way. And so I like kind of lifted it out of the ground and underneath was an ant's nest. So, uh, you know, I disrupted their home and now these ants are scrambling about and carrying their eggs in every direction. And when you look at that, you know, from a human point of view, it seemed like chaos, but when I happened to walk by that spot 45 minutes later, they were all gone. I don't know where they went, but I know that they mm. went, you know, somewhere safe to rebuild their home. Nobody told them to do that, right? Like they're just, their circumstances changed and, and they adapted. Um, and I see, I see that in nature every single day. I see that in humans too. And in the way we organize every other part of our life, but for some reason at work, we're like, Oh, the rock moved. I'll just wait for the CEO ant to tell me where to go. <laughs> mm -hmm. Love that example. Yeah, what what resonated for me in in the reinventing organizations book, especially, is that we work within these paradigms, and in the orange paradigm, um, you believe that in order to get the most out of people, you need to manage them, and in the teal paradigm, we're people positive. We believe in people we trust people you know generally speaking we believe in collective intelligence is smarter than my own intelligence provided i'm in the collective and my voice is heard and that that's the most like that is it's just true <laughs> it's true that people when you believe in them and you trust them um you know they will exceed the expectations that you had when you didn't believe and trust trust them and yeah, that, that's, that's, why, um, that, that's why Teal ultimately will and is more successful. The problem is, and this, I call it the final frontier, the people that are in charge today largely don't believe in people or are in the paradigm you know, where it's like, no, no, in order to get the most out of people, I got to manage them. And that's the thing that we need to challenge with stories and examples like this. Um, it's mm -hmm. a different paradigm. It's a different belief system. Well, we got a question. Thanks, and yes, Axel, go ahead. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much for this super inspiring story. But actually, as you were just mentioning this orange environment, and my question is, who do you, when you turn this, when you had this management switch and you went for chill? Who did you communicate to the external world this changement and who do did they react even today? Because I know that for some companies it's kind of challenging to communicate with stakeholders when you have this completely new way of working. So who who did you handle this? Stakeholders external to our organization. Yes. Um, well, I mean, I think our most 
significant stakeholders would be our customers and our customers do not care that we're self-organized. <laughs> yeah, no, customers usually. I think we thought they would when we, we were like, hey, we've done this radical thing. It's so great. We're so in love with, you know, what we've done. And they're like, that's nice. Like, okay, what did, what have you delivered and for how much? And um, that's the one stakeholder that's coming to mind for me, Edwin. Yeah, I wish people cared, uh, but they generally don't. Or they look at us like, what? Uh, okay, whatever. Um, they either don't believe it or they, they just think it's weird. Um, the other stakeholder that many companies have to worry about, and Lalu talks about this in the book, is the board. And we're lucky because, um, you know, Tim, who um, he owns 100% of the company, and he's all about Teal. And he also, you know, kind of handpicks and selects and manages the board as well. So that's the one thing that Lulu said is really critical is, is to have the ownership on board. And that's a stakeholder that we've been able to manage, you know, through him. Um, but I'm sure when the banks talk to us and stuff, I don't think we tell them that we don't have managers. <laughs> Um, we probably only share it with people that where we think it, they're going to like and appreciate that. And we don't really share it with other stakeholders. I, yeah, that's a great question, Axel. And, and I, it also strikes me going back to what you were saying uh, about the final frontier, Edwin, uh, you and I were talking the other, yesterday about what are some of these forces that are, that are maybe going to are starting to crack that belief of the leadership that you can't trust people. Uh, you mentioned DAOs, the crypto movement, uh, some of these decentralizing principles that are underway. Another one that I'm familiar with is, is sort of the great place to work movement. You know, you guys have been on those lists. I used to, I spent seven years at Great Place to Work doing writing and, and research for Great Place to Work. And I think that, that community of companies, which is in the 10,000 range now globally is, they believe that you can trust people. I mean, they're still mostly green, I would say, or orange or green. They're still comfortable with hierarchy, uh, but they're they're one step away, you might say, from from going to where you all went. And I'm curious if you share that sense from you know, dealing with other great places to work in Canada, if you ever communicate with them, but do you see some hope there? Um, I, I would say they're very much green or they're orange, you know, pretending to be green. But they're green mm -hmm. in terms of they, you know, the CEO is, is the parent, is the yeah. benevolent good parent, right? And what I call the final frontier from, from a power dynamic leadership point of view is um, I, I, what I see, and I went through this myself, that senior leaders believe that they are responsible for other people. They're responsible for entire teams or divisions or departments or initiatives or projects. They're responsible for what other people do. And that's a really big weight emotionally to carry around. And what we've noticed is just because we say you're not the manager anymore doesn't mean that they don't still feel responsible for other people. And that's a really tricky and hard thing to help people work through is to actually let go, to actually realize that I can give you my advice, but if you make the wrong decision, that's on you, that's not on me. I'm not responsible for you. I'm just responsible for giving you feedback um, and telling you what I think. And until we get, as a good Teal community, until we get good at helping people work, senior people work through that, I don't think that this movement's gonna grow um, all that fast. I see that as the final frontier. Interesting. Well, speaking of final frontiers, we're in our, our last couple minutes here, and um, I'm going to invite folks to, to, to know that you can, we will be continuing this conversation, kind of developing our learning further in a, in a spatial chat uh, in a garden, number four, virtual garden. I just put it in the, in the chat where you can go. Um, I'm going to be going there. I, Edwin and Luth, are you going to be able to attend that as well? It's a spatial chat in a garden. I just got to go just to see what that is. I don't even understand <laughs> what you're talking about. It's, it's a, kind of a newfangled way of, of kind of a moving your, your, an icon of yourself around. You can talk to each other. And, and um, yeah, it's, it's a pretty neat way to have more conversation. If you wanted to like talk individually to someone, you two could move your 
icons to a little bit of a different place in the garden. Like, well, do you want me to buy the, the tulip bush? Why didn't you just say we're going to the it's, metaverse? It's kind of, yeah, I suppose you could say that. Um, but at any rate, uh, please join us there in, in a few minutes. Um, I want to see if there's any other follow, any final questions or comments from the, from, uh, the folks here who are attending and participating in this conversation. Appreciate it, all, all the ones so far. Any, any additional or final questions from folks? Okay, Ed, you owe Tolga a prize for the juiciest question. Um, yeah, was that was that the one about um, dealing with the leaders? Compensation, and he wants oh, to get paid. Okay. He wants to get paid in See, Bitcoin. I, I, I actually it. thought the leadership one was more juicy, to be honest. Yeah. Um, but you guys dealt with that so so sweetly that uh, yeah. <laughs> A lot of juicy stuff here. I mean, I, 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 the only sad thing to me about our, our conversation is that no more, more, more people didn't come, but it is, a, you know, there were the right people for the right time here, you know, as part of the Teal principles. And I, I loved the, the chance to hear your guys' story. And I, um, I hope that it will be shared more, more widely. I think it's a super powerful one to start convincing uh, some of those leaders and get, move, move past that final frontier and, and inspire people to keep going, as you put in your last slide. Uh, that it may be hard at times, um, and yet it's worth it. So, um, Edwin and, or Luth, anything, any final comment you'd like to make at this point? Thanks to you, Ed, for uh, being a very engaging facilitator and, and for the great questions that people asked. Yeah, this is fun. I just really enjoy being able to say orange and green and teal without having to explain what the hell I'm talking about. That was my favorite part of this meeting. <laughs> right on. Okay, well, Meet you in the garden, folks. Spatial <laughs> chat, room number, garden number four. Uh, so, thanks everyone, and we'll 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 see you later. Yeah.